You can go to the doctor, go take yoga, meditate, go see the doctor, go see Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil. You can kneel down and pray, but your everyday words are going to hold you up in your life. The cussing, the shouting, the things that you say manifests in your body. And you say, I have a, an acquaintance. He thinks I'm a nutcase because he doesn't believe what I say. I'm forever taking him to the doctor. He's had operations on his bowels. One of his favorite words is S-H-I-T. He says that all day long. Him and his wife of 17 years, his common law wife, they're on again, off again, on again, off again. And his other favorite word is the F word. That word means having fun in bed. And if you're having fun in bed, that's not a swear word. Let me tell you the origin of that word. King Henry VIII. A lot of hanky-panky going on in the palace. And of course, he wasn't too much of a Catholic back then. And fighting at night. He's with my woman, she's with my man, blah, 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 blah. He said, look, I'm tired of all this fighting at night. If you want to get together with somebody, you come and see me. And if I approve it, it's okay. So when you go to see the king, he give you a note that said, fornication under the certification of the king, F-U-C-K. Take this, you're hanging on your door. So if you see John and Sally go in the bedroom, and they put that on the door, it's okay, the king said it was all right. That's the origin of that word. So, when people today, there's so much cussing going on. You go to a movie, you turn on the TV, you hear that word. It's inappropriate. If I don't like this chair, hey, and I use that word on this chair, this chair ain't having sex. <laughs> but what you're doing, you're sending that energy with that word. And is that energy coming back into your bedroom? You having trouble finding a mate because that's your favorite word. So you have to be careful of your daily, everyday words and the power that you're given to. Them. Now, another thing is, Mama. Mama was the first hypnotist. Mama taught you how to catch a cold. Now everybody here. Mama told you how to catch a cold. One mama said, if you don't wear your hat. Another one said, you don't put on your sweater. Another one said, you get your feet wet. Another one said, you don't wear your boots. The other one says, you get caught in a drip. All these different things that mama told you how to catch a cold. If mama was right, we'd all be in bed right now. Because some of those things would have to be. But mama programmed you to what she was programmed to. So if you sit in front of the air conditioner, you're going to get a cold. If you go outside without your coat or sweater, you're going to get a cold. Because mama programmed you. So you have to be careful what you tell your children. Not, you're going to be just like your grandpa. Yeah, you're going to be just like your grandpa. You got two degrees. But not that that grandpa that was a drunk. You have to watch what you tell your children and what you tell yourself. So when you go to the doctor and he gives you a pill, or you go to the evangelist on TV and he lays his hand on you, you fall out, you're healed. But then the next week you're sick again. You're sick, the pills didn't work, the vitamins didn't work, the Reiki didn't work, this didn't work, the hypnotist didn't work. No, it's your words that you keep saying all day long. You sit down, like my friend, I said, who had these ailments. He's got high blood pressure. That comes from yelling and screaming all the time. Like I said, he had trouble with his bowels because he uses the, the S word. He's always saying, God damn this or that. He shouts. 
And so he's terribly sick and he says to me, you tell me to pray. He says, I pray, I go to the Baptist church, I pray. I said, yeah, you pray five minutes a day and 16 hours you're cussing. So you eliminate your prayers by what you say. You program yourself. Also, your name. Ah, uh, what's your name? Your name Penelope? Everybody calls you Penny. Are you broke? <laughs> Think about what your name is. People are constantly calling you by your name. Now, for instance, hey, six generations ago, great-great-grandpa came from the old country on the boat. His last name, what does it mean? You don't know. You don't speak Russian or Polish or Italian. You don't know what that word means. But the meaning of that word <coughs> is in the ethers. So every time people say something to you and use that word, hey, it programs you. Now, I had a client who was an alcoholic. <coughs> I, keep, I go to the, the, the 12 step program. I go here, I go there. I tried everything, but I'm an alcoholic. I can't get away from it. I said, change your name. What? His name was Good Rum. <laughs> I said to him, oh, was your, grand, was your father an alcoholic? Yeah. Your grandpa? Yeah. He said, you must be psychic. I said, no. You changed your name. Another guy came. He was doing terrible with his business. Oh, what's his business? He said, every time, three times I started a different business, and they folded and said, change your name. His name was Cheatham. <laughs> My husband brought home a co-worker, and we were talking about something, and I said, oh, here's an article. Read it. He said, I can't read. I said, oh, your father couldn't read either. He says, no, Grandpa couldn't read either. I said, change your name. His name was Dumbleton. So the origin of last words have to do with the occupation, the town a person came from, uh, what they did other than uh, the town, or they were somebody's son, if your name was Donald. Okay, you're Donald. Donald's son would be Donald's son. Mac Donald is Donald's grandson. I went to Ireland, that's how I learned that. <laughs> and so you have to think about, what's your name? Cooper, those were people that made barrels. Smith was a blacksmith. Taylor, so close. So find out what your last name means in the language of origin, because everybody says your name. Ah, it's in the atmosphere. What does that name mean? And what is it doing to your life? So you have to remember that names also. And uh, I know that uh, hey, when Negroes became black people and then African Americans, they started to get African names. And they named your kid the African name, but you don't know what it means. It's an African name, and who knows? Your kid, they call you that kid that name, and you can hardly spell it, but. What did it mean in that country in Africa that it came from? And this is quite a thing. When uh, I had uh, my cousin introduce me to his wife when I went to New Orleans. Who was her name? Was Mary Wan. Oh, I said, huh, somebody in your family, you named after somebody? Yeah, Grandma. Okay, Grandma. Well, our friend before us was talking about diversity. After the Civil War, when female slaves got to go to the hospital to have their uh, babies or white, um, what do you call them, midwives, they played tricks on them. Now, way back then, I remember when I was a little girl, we didn't know the proper name of body parts. <coughs> we had our slang words for body parts. So okay, we're talking 100 years back, 
you go to have your baby, and then the midwife says, hey, what are you going to name your baby? Peter. Oh, Peter. There's too many Peters. Name him Penis. Oh, what are you going to name your daughter? Virginia. Oh, too many people named Virginia. Call them Virginia. You don't know the name of the word, so that's how she got the name marijuana. And when I was in New Orleans, the ceiling fell. I called my cousin. He said, I'm going to send a friend over. I'm going to send a friend over who is uh, going to help you with the seal. Okay. The guy comes over and he says, um, hi. Hi, Sylvia. My name is Uria. I said, oh. I said, was your father's name Uria? No, he said, my uncle, my father's brother, and my grandpa, his name was Uria. I said, uh, you got kidney problems in your family? He said, how would you know? It's a hereditary. I said, what's hereditary is your name. And people are calling you Urea. And if you're a bad little boy, and I'm saying, Urea, Urea, hey, all the thousands of uh, watts. What happens to your body? So you think about, if you're sick, what's your name? What are people calling you? You got nicknames. And I'm fortunate, my name is Barker. And you know what a Barker does. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so you think about that, what your name does, and that you're all hypnotized, and then you don't need to go and look for a hypnotist and say, I don't want to smoke, I don't want to eat too much, because, you know, when they, we did have advertising for smoking, you could say, oh, I don't want to smoke. Hey, you get off the bus, you're riding on a bus, and there's a big sign with a camel. Get camels, you turn on a TV, and it will smoke camels, smoke cools, whatever it is that you smoke, and it programmed us. And when I was a teacher, teenager, what programmed us then? Soon you'll be 18, and you can legally smoke. And we couldn't wait until we were 18 so we could get that cigarette and smoke because everybody else was doing it. So that's also hypnosis, whatever your peers are doing. Now, there are people, and we're all talk about the hypnosis of drinking. Hey, how many advertisements have you seen for non-alcoholic beer and non-alcoholic wine? They exist. And I've been drinking non-alcoholic beer for 20 years. You go this it's not sold at the corner store, it's in all the supermarkets. How many of you people here have ever heard of non-alcoholic beer? Okay. Every time I am in Tops or Wegmans and I'm getting the beer, and if there's somebody else buying beer, I say, hey, do you know about non-alcoholic beer? And they look at me, what? What? I don't want no non-alcoholic beer. I said, no, but you drink milk. There ain't no alcohol. You drink orange juice. You drink Coca-Cola. You drink water. There's no alcohol in it. What's wrong with trying non-alcoholic beer? It tastes exactly the same. But then when the cops stop you, you can walk the line. <laughs> and you could also drink a whole six pack and not get sick and still take your medicine. So these are things that hypnotize us, that keep us stymied. And then you want to go to see the hypnotherapist and stop drinking, stop smoking, stop this, stop that, doing everything. Yes. You're ready for me to but shut up. <laughs> okay. okay. And so I'm going to shut up, but I hope that you have learned. And what you have to remember is what is your favorite saying, and what is your word name, and how much energy you give to those cuss words, and eliminate them.
because once you know the proper meaning of the word, what you're shouting doesn't fit. So I'm through talking, and they said maybe if they had time later on, I'd tell a story. But if you never hear a story, come next year. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for sitting here and listening, and I hope I have a is scientifically proven by Dr. Emoto, Japanese professor who's done research on everything I've said and he's done research to show you how what you say manifests in your life and if anybody wants to look at this book and I've also written a book that's out of print. It's called You Are Already Hypnotized. So anybody, it's out of print now. Anybody who would like to copy, give me your name and address on a piece of paper and say you want my book so that when it comes out, which may be six months to a year, I'll send you a copy. Thank you.